Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, evening, morning, uh, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us on this uh, Modern History of Sake webinar, uh, which Natsuki is hosting. Um, so just a brief uh, couple of words from me first off. Uh, I'm Julia with WSET School. Um, this is one of a series of webinars that we have started um, since the lockdown began. And we're hoping to continue to bring you uh, more and more different events, informative events that can keep you interested, keep you occupied. So do keep checking back in on our events page, sign up to as many as you'd like, and we hope to see you soon. Uh, we are going to be recording this, so uh, the plan is to send the recording out to everyone that's registered. So if you uh, do miss it, or if anyone you know has missed it, you should be able to access it there. Um, but that is all from me, and I will pass you over to Natsuki to get started. Great. Thank you, Julia. So um, this is my ever first um, webinar, and I'm, I've been lecturing WCT Level 3 uh, in the past seven years. So um, I'm quite comfortable talking to in front of a lot of people, but never being talking in front of the computer or my mobile. So I'm um, a little bit nervous at this moment. <laughs> and uh, but thank you so much for joining. Um, at the moment, we have about uh, 265 attendees total, which is great turnout. Um, I've seen a lot of sake educators, WCT sake educators, sake uh, friends, the IWC judges, also some of the students that I taught already, like some sake friends. Um, so thank you so much uh, for joining. But if, uh, whoever who hasn't I personally met, my name is Natsuki Kikuya. Um, I reside in London um, for the past 11 years. Um, but first, uh, my connection to sake is my family, uh, who uh, my mother's side family, uh, who is in Akita, who is making sake over 300 years. Um, that's my connection to sake. And I moved to UK 11 years ago, and uh, first, my first job was working as a sake sommelier in London as a, um, as, um, at Zuma and Roka restaurant. And about eight years ago, I became independent um, sake consultant, educator, and that's when I started working with WCT. And uh, with the help um, from Anthony Moss MW, uh, who many of you already know as well, um, we created this WCT Level 3 qualification, um, and then also level one on the following year. Um, so um, before I start, I just wanted to thank all, in case is any essential workers in this group uh, who is helping in the medical service or distribution sectors and uh, as well as the service industry. Thank you so much for all your hard work um, during this hard period and um, yeah, att attending for this seminar. So just, I think everybody's mind is, I think everywhere at this moment and in un uncertain circumstances. And I just hope this uh, one hour time uh, at the webinar, we can drink sake together and um, learn about history and relax a little bit and also thinking about the future. And I think um, that's why the topic um, history of sake really suits at this point because you know, a lot of times we learn things from history and the past histories and um, you know, sake having the history of over 2000 years, um, it's been always with us in Japan. Um, and you know we've been contribute uh, the sake has been contributing a lot to the history and history has been contributing to sake itself so we learned this um during this time it's quite limited one hour hopefully we can all fit in um but also i want to make this time to, to, to think uh, um what we can do for the future for the sake industry so today i just wanted to introduce what i'm drinking um 6 p.m so early enough to drink sake. So today I'm drinking um, sake from Hiroshima Prefecture, one of the quite big sake regions um, in Japan called Ozasaya Taketsuru. So if you hear the word Taketsuru, maybe some of you might ring the bell, oh yes, Taketsuru whiskey. So yes, that's uh, it. Actually, the founder of Taketsuru whiskey is uh, its, uh, actual home. It's um, running a sake brewery before. So that's the sake coming from that. And this sake is a very um, classic sake that I wanted to bring for this seminar because that um, kind of bring, bring us back to um, very ancient type of, time of sake that's before the modern uh, sake has been created. So uh, whoever 
it's quite geeky already about sake. This sake is kimoto. So it's the techniques that's being founded um, quite a long time, uh, for 300 years, uh, that's incorporating the lactic acid bacteria in instead of adding a lactic acid liquid. Um, that's already been manufactured, it's a quite modern thing. Um, as well, this is um, matured sake that's brewed in 2016. So it's already been four years matured. So maybe many of you have heard that sake um, you have to drink quite quick. But uh, class, uh, traditionally in the past, uh, it's, it, there, there were culture to age sake and mature, drink, appreciate the matured sake as well. So this is quite layer -like side of matured sake that has a deeper flavors and colors. And it's also um, made with a wooden barrel. So most of the sake makers being modernized, uh, you'll learn this later on, but um, so I started using stainless steel tank, enamel coated tank. But in the back then, in the other period, like 300 years ago, almost all the sake were uh, brewed and stored and trans uh, shipped in the wooden barrels because they, they weren't any other containers available. So this sake was fermented in a wooden barrel, which is quite rare to see these days. And this is Genshu, which is undiluted, and Muroka, which is unchako fine. And they use the rice called Hattan, which is one of the significant rice varietal uh, from Hiroshima Prefecture. Maybe you've heard of a variety called Hattan Nishiki or Hattan So, um, but this is Hattan, uh, one of the other family. So the sake has a little yellow golden colors, really nice maturation of nutty coffee, little bit mushroomy type of flavor, uh, aromas. Very delicious, quite rich and quite a lot of acidity and umami. So all these things that I mentioned earlier uh, gives this firmness, richness, and then the maturation gives a caramelization kind of flavor to the sake and makes them quite tasty. So anyway, just wanted to start to the topic today about the history of the sake. So today, um, Judy, if you can flip to the next slide. By the way, this picture is from um, one of the rice fields um, from Mie Prefecture. That's very, very beautiful. Um, so today, um, as a modern history, um, we start from Meiji period, which is 1868. So a lot of people might recall the historical event in Japan when you say Meiji period, uh, there's a Meiji illustration. So up to Meiji period, um, in Japan, we are all living in the samurai era, in the Edo period. So everybody was wearing kimonos and uh, sword and samurai are fighting against each other. And, um, and we had a quite long period of isolation and ex um, of ourselves from other countries. So we developed our very unique culture of ourselves. Um, um, but then also growing the kind of city culture of Edo. Edo is a former Tokyo. So it's, it's been a capital of Japan since uh, around that time and exceeded the one million uh, population. Um, and then uh, a lot of suburb, suburban prefectures had been contributing a lot of um, products and service. And that's when the, a lot of entertainment culture has been um, developed in Japan, such as kabuki, sumo, ukiyo-e art, as well as the food culture. So you may know your favorite uh, Japanese food, sushi. Um, this is when, at Edo period, this is when, um, around the late 18th century. That's, this is when the, these food culture kind of blossomed in Tokyo, same as tempura or soba noodles, uh, sukiyaki. So these, these things um, was found within this um, kind of blossom of entertaining culture in the Edo period. And uh, sake up until Edo period um, was, um, as I mentioned, the sake has a history of about 2,000 years. So coming from a very, very ancient time, all this, our ancestor has been um, forming a lot of techniques and try and error and experimenting sake techniques. But Edo period is when a uh, lot of sake production techniques um, has been uh, firmed or conf uh, finalized. So such as uh, if you're already quite familiar about the sake, uh, three stage addition of the sake. So you, when you add all the ingredients to the tank, you actually split into three different stages over four days, instead of putting everything at once. Um, that is a safer and consistent way of um, uh, fermenting sake later stage. And then as well as the pasteurization techniques. So one of the thing, the sake is sake never contains sulfide. 
Um, so instead of adding that, we uh, have been actually pasteurizing sake to stabilize the sake quality. Um, this has been also found in, during this time, as well as uh, forming a toji system. So maybe some of you heard of toji. Some, some of the Japanese terms that you, it's nice to remember. So toji, T-O-J-I, is uh, master, uh, master brewer of the sake, uh, or head of the sake brewer. That's the top of the sake brewery, and he works as a conductor within the organization to form a sake production at, at the, uh, in, in one season. So um, during the Edo period, the organization of the sake, technique of the sake has been blossomed, as well as the entertainment culture. But what happens in a major period is uh, quite radical. So as I mentioned, um, all these hundreds of years of the isolation away from the um, other foreign cultures, the Meiji government opened the door, opened the port, opened the gate to foreign people. Um, Julia, if you can flip to the next page, that'd be great. Thank you. So Meiji period between 1868 to 1912, as well as following Taisho period, which is 1912 to 1926. This is when um, I call sake prayed as a national finance pillar. Um, so as I mentioned, Meiji restoration, op um, Meiji government opened the country door, gate to a lot of foreign cultures. Um, so the first uh, presence of the sake outside of Japan was this time, such as um, you know the Vienna Expo or Paris Expo. Uh, so a lot of sake has been exported to European countries for the first time around this time. And um, wh what government did around this time is they wanted to um, use sake as uh, income. So. One of the things they did at the very first stage uh, when the Meiji government opened up uh, was a full liberalization of uh, entry to sake production. So up until Edo period, uh, the government was really strictly controlling the sake production, um, how much to make and who is to make. But around this time, they actually opened this, uh, liberalized the entry to the sake production. So um, and, uh, in 1881, there were about 26, uh, 800 sake breweries existing, but because of this liberalization um, act that's being established in 1875, it's jumped up to 10,000. So there were 10,000 sake breweries all around Japan after this act. And so everybody was going in, in, into the sake production and um, which you know, a lot of amateur people are starting to make sake or changing their business to sake brewing. Um, is you can easily imagine that people fail. So um, I also learned that the 8.5% of the sake tax was exempt due to spoilage of the sake. So even though a lot of people jump into the sake industry, they couldn't make it. They, it was quite, take, take, you know, quite difficult to make the sake safely at that time as well. So they failed it. Um, so I, I can imagine it, it was quite inconsistent um, style of sake you can get for, uh, from around that time. Um, and one thing I wanted to, you to remember around this time, Meiji Taisho period, is this major revision of new taxation policy. So as I mentioned, government wanted to use sake as one of the biggest income for, for their budget. Um, Zōkokuze um, has been issued in 1878, which is um, um, the blue tax taxed based on the sake. So up until then, the, all the tax from the sake was coming from the alcohol percentages. But uh, what the government changed is they started to tax all the sake um, produced in a year. So even, you know, so as soon as sake has been pressed, that's the amount that you have to pay um, as a sake tax to the government. Um, as you can imagine, this type of sake that I've been drinking um, is being matured more than two, one year, two years, three years. Um, so, uh, from the 11th century, the Japanese people are actually aging or maturing sake. There was a culture there as well. But imagine you have to pay a tax for all the sake being, being stored at the brewery. That's a quite difficult. So, I can see around this, uh, because of the Zōkokuze um, Act, uh, a lot of sake makers actually have to give up on making koshu or jukseshu, which is a matured sake. 
um, so this culture actually died out around this time. And um, around 60 years ago, so um, this um, government, uh, this policy has been removed. So now you can see variety of the sake, as you know, there's a eight sake as well. But uh, for, for a long time, this culture has been forgotten, I can say. And then other things, uh, a lot of grass bottles and ishobin bottles has been uh, introduced to Japan. So that introduction of the grass ishobin bottle, um, as I mentioned, sake has been stored and fermented and all carried in a wooden barrels or wooden, uh, wooden um, vessels up until then. So with the introduction of the glass vessels, um, all this wooden fermenting or wooden store, uh, taruzake, such as uh, wooden but stored sake, has been slowly disappearing um, from that time. And um, another thing that I want to introduce, uh, to, uh, talk a little bit about this time is the um, foreign government advisors. Um, so the government actually invited a lot of foreign government uh, foreign advisors from in a different sectors like science or academics, um, um, art, all these categories, and including sake as well. So uh, there were the, the the gentleman called William William Atkinson. Um, he did actually study about the chemistry of the sake brewing, and he he was writing that um, he discovered sake makers are pasteurizing sake without using a thermometer at that time. Um, that's uh, that's being issued in 1881, and uh, he was saying that the sake maker in Japan that time were actually drawing on the surface of the sake the character no. So no is like a Japanese hiragana character that's kind of like a circle. Um, so they are drawing a no uh, character on the surface of the sake when they are pasteurizing, and you can barely light it that's the right temperature to pasteurize. So they're using the kind of senses and, you know, um, to, to pasteurize at time. And knowing that the Louis Pasteur has been discovering the pasteurization techniques in 1862, um, he was writing the sake maker already knew how to pasteurize from the 12th century, which is quite surprising. Um, so together with this Zokokuze, um, Zokokuze Act, um, with the taxing, uh, you know, the government enforcing to tax more, rely on the sake to, for, the, for the incomes. Uh, up until one time, 35% uh, of the national income was uh, alcohol tax. So they are, sake, they are really heavily um, rely on the sake. And one of the uh, things they did to enhance this is abolishment of home brewing sake. So um, up until then, um, very casual sake that you drink at home, it was doburoku. So Akemi-san Aria was talking um, about during the quarantine, she's making doburoku at home and in her house in London. So they were, she was making very home brewing style of sake, which is called doburoku in Japanese. Um, so up until this time, um, or the family, uh, it was a work for the mothers. They, they'll make the doburoku very classic, um, very not complicated. You can make in a jar, small portions, uh, slightly low alcoholic, can be quite creamy, porridge without the filtration. That was the, you know, drink, uh, the drink for every day. But the government, because they wanted to get a little bit more tax uh, for, from the sake consumption, they abolished home brewing culture. So doburo, this is when the Doboroku culture died as well, um, which is a little bit sad for me. But um, with the help of the government, um, the sake makers, it's been revived uh, in the modern days. Uh, we will cover that later on for the certain areas to be able to make doburoku today. And uh, another thing around the early 1900s or 1904, uh, National Research Institute of Brewing, which we call NRIV, um, has been founded. It's a Jap Japanese government um, research institute uh, who study and research and um, teaches about the sake and alcohol um, brewing in Japan. So their aim was to develop sake techniques and share and improving safety. Um, up until this point, um, you know, as I mentioned, because of the liberalization of the sake entry business, entry to sake business, a lot of sake makers started making uh, sake. 
but they didn't know really how to because most of the sake techniques and the knowledge wasn't being um, academically shared throughout Japan. It was kind of secret within each breweries. So some sake brewery has their own Kuratsuki Kobo, which is an um, ambient sake uh, east uh, residing in the brewery, make, which makes the sake, successfully makes the sake tasty. But some brewery failed. So um, it was quite inconsistent quality. So in order to you know, improve the sake quality so they can tax a little bit more, um, they founded this National Research Institute of Brewing, uh, which I call after this establishment of this organization, uh, there was kind of sake renaissance era came into the sake industry. So um, some of the notable discoveries or um, things they did is uh, establishing or dis uh, inventing a Yamahai and Sokujo Shubo. So as I mentioned earlier, the sake that I'm tasting is made with Kimoto Shubo, which is uh, one of the starter, the early stage of the sake production, sake fermentation. Um, instead of putting everything at the once, they start from very small scratch kind of like making a soda bread. You make from the small starter um, for the yeast to grow populations in there safely, so they can later um, build their own fermentation mash in a three-stage addition. Um, Kimoto is the starter that rely on the natural lactic acid bacillus to prohibit all the other microbes to jump inside of the sake to keep the sake mash safe. Um, and we've um, discovered that uh, addition of the lactic acid liquids um, from the manufacturer would pretty much do the same rather than waiting for the lactic acid bacillus in the air to jump inside, as well as uh, Yamahai Shubo, which is still considered as a family of the Kimoto style, but uh, for the Kimoto um, Shubo making, you actually have to puddle the rice into paste, um, which could be a quite labor intensive and hard work for sake producer at that time as well. So they um, discover that actually this puddling, the pole lamming of the sake into paste um, doesn't mean anything. So you can skip that. So that was Yamahai, which is abbreviation of Yama Oroshi Haishi. So these two techniques has been found as a modern techniques introduced in 1904, um, as well as sorry, 1909, and as well as the new uh, establishment of national new sake contest. So this was a national level competition of sake this time. So for each sake producer to compete their own techniques to each other, um, they sent some of the sake that specially made for the competition purposes. And Enrif was the one who was moderating this contest. Um, because they wanted to compete techniques, the category of the sake they're making was not the sake that they're actually selling to the consumer. So they are actually challenging to make Ginjo style of sake, which is very, very new around this time um, to, 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 to make. So Ginjo type of sake, I'll explain to you a little bit later stage. It's involving a um, polishing, polishing of the sake rice into a quite small degrees, like nearly half of the size, where up until this time, all the rice was making almost this brown because the rice polishing machines or milling machine techniques has, could only make the rice polishing uh, um, up to maybe 80 or 70 percent max to remain remaining so only able to rem uh, remove 30 or 40 percent away um, from the core of the rice from out the layer of the rice um, but ginjo side of sake you actually polish the rice to further degrees and then you ferment in the lower temperature the koji making for ginjo sake also involved a lot of skills as well um, so that was a category that's being um, developed alongside with the development of a national new sake contest. It's a very highly prestigious um, contest that, um, you know, uh, and most historical, I can say, apart from one year um, which has been lost by the war, um, since this uh, time, uh, 1911, it's been happening every single year and still happening this, uh, this year as well. And uh, because it's so highly, highly um, regarded contest, some producer have to um, like commit a suicide one time uh, in, after kind of failing to win the competition, getting a gold medal after the competition. So um, that's the competition that just started from this time. And number one is um, has been isolated 
in 1906. So this is another thing that National Research Institute of Brewing, a um, similar organization called Brewing Society of Japan, had started to do. So because there was a lot of spoilage of the sake at that time, because we did, they didn't have any modern facility of the sake production, there's no temperature control. There was not, you know, they're all using uh, ambient yeast uh, to make sake. So some producer, um, you know, successfully make sake, but many of them failed. So, um, you know, some of the areas such as, um, the, they're known for the super soft water quality, like Hiroshima, for example, they didn't have enough mineral in the water to, to boost the fermentation, keep, you know, uh, to, to, to continue. So, um, that was very troublesome around time. So, development of the yeast, which could safely um, ferment the sake, so create a quite strong fermentation um, is, is, was quite needed. So that's the one of the things that the government did as well. So isolating a uh, yeast that was deciding from the very good sake brewery, a top sake maker. So number one yeast was isolated from Sakura Masamune um, brewery in Hyogo prefecture. So Nada is one of the biggest region of the sake from that time as well. So, um, so after from number one, some sake, uh, a sake East number two was isolated from Gekkeikan, from Fushimi region of Kyoto Prefecture. That's the second biggest sake production in Japan. And then following to Hiroshima. So um, that's how, and they all named with the numbers, with the, the order of the isolation um, in history. And uh, when we go into the Taisho period, which is kind of a continuous of the Meiji period, the government started to go into this wartime. Um, so there's World War I happened in between 1914 to 18. Um, and then uh, the America set the prohi prohibition law in 1920. So Japan is kind of following the other countries, Western countries to go into the wartime. So in order to getting ready for um, the wartime, they have to get more money for the army. To, to, to fight, uh, fight in the wartime. So the, the, the tax was getting heavier and heavier. And as I mentioned earlier, at one point, the tax, sake tax was 35% of the national income. And uh, Gosei Seishu um, has been invented in 1920 in Taisho period, which um, was, a, you can translate as a synthetic sake. So because they wanted to kind of lower the budget and make the sake more efficiently and safely um, in response, also in response to the booming population of Japan, um, they came with the, the techniques to make sake with less rice. So this is kind of the origin of the um, sanzoshu, which is a triple diluted sake that's coming the later kind of the history, but that's the how um, sake started to be a little bit more um, alter, alter, altered, I can say. Um, so up until then, all the sake was junmai, 100% made with um, uh, rice. Some shochu were added in order for the preserved purposes, but um, you know, a lot of, lot of te techniques that's being found around this time is to make the sake safely, efficiently, big volumes, and um, cheaper price which um, kind of make me sad to talk a little bit about it. Um, if you flick to the next page, Julia, which um, I can say, it's a lost hundred years. Uh, so for the sake history, um, these were time, were the worst time of within the sake history that really was in the sake quality. Um, really kind of forgot the, each producer forgot the identity, uh, change the dynamic of the sake industry during this period as well. Um, so, um, 1937, there was Japan-China War. Um, this is when, in, in 38, there was a National General Mo Mo Mobilization Act um, issued, which, um, you know, that you have to put more effort on, um, war, uh, on fighting in the wartime, so you have to limit your own um, you have to you know, forget about your greed. You have to contribute yourself to, the, to getting ready for the war time. So that was the kind of mood around that time in Japan. Um, so around that time, the, the law against porished rice has been issued. So even though the, they are starting to have this uh, Ginjo culture 
um, coming from the new sake contest, um, the older sake producers started to challenge themselves to make uh, quality of the sake by making ginjo sake. The government actually set the law against um, not to polish the rice so much. So uh, with this policy, um, you, are, you could only polish the rice up to 65%, not, nothing less than that. So only 35% of the rice has been removed max, maximum. Um, so you could only make the sake junmai category or honjozo category or futsushu in a sense of today. Um, and also within this National General, National General Mobilization Act, um, uh, 2 million koku, um, which is about 30, 60 million liters of crop yield of the sake, specific rice was forced to be decreased in production in order to secure rice for food. Um, so because of the priority, you have to give all the labor force to the army, so less uh, cultivation, cultivation of the rice, which could be prioritized for food purposes, um, eating purposes, rather than making sake. So which really makes the um, lead the sake production to decline in half around this time. Um, so I mentioned because of the liberalization act and early um, uh, Meiji period, a lot of producers jumped op or opened up as a sake maker but the number of the sake brewery really declined around this time. And then we had World War II um, between 1939 to 45. Um, uh, the Food Control System uh, or Food Control Act has been issued in 1942, which, um, uh, which the, um, the government had a complete control of the rice production and the distribution of the sake in, in order to avoid the price fluctuation, fluctuation of, the, of the rice. So um, this, uh, this act or system has been continued until 1970, which um, really stopped all the sake maker to grow their own rice. So you, you know, if you know in, coming from the wine background, uh, you can easily think all the sake makers in Japan should grow their own rice. You know, they have their own rice field next to the brewery. That's ideal if you're coming from the wine background. Um, and yes, from the original sake brewery, most of them are um, coming from the wealthy landowners, um, many of them. So they had a lot of vast majority of the rice field, but because of the food control system or food control act, they had to give away of their rice cultivation um, and have to be controlled by the government production as well. So up until, um, 1970, no producer was able to grow their own rice, sadly. And then uh, 1943, uh, establishment of Kyubetsu Seido has been introduced. So Q means great. Um, so they graded the, so up until then, all the sake taxation, as I mentioned, was based on ABB and that was the classification of the sake. But they introduced this new classification that consists of tokyu, which means supreme grade, ikkyu, which means first grade, and then nikkyu, which means second grade. So the three grades are systems in the category of the sake. Um, and it does kind of sound, sounds like, oh, maybe quality of the sake based, based on the quality of the sake, but it wasn't uh, really. So um, based on the um, grade, they, there are different taxation rates. For example, for Tokyo, the supreme grade, you have to pay 38.4% of the tax. Whereas for Nikkyu, the second grade, you could only pay for 13.9% of the tax. So you're pretty much buying the grade of the sake. But um, and this time they say on the documents that um, uh, you have to pay to register to the sensory evaluation ass assess, um, assessment and the professional assessor is assess the, the colors and flavor of the sake by the negative checks and they'll make it into a supreme. But uh, in fact, as long, as long as you pay the tax to be qualified as a Tokyo, you could name any sake as supreme grade. Um, I guess that is coming from, again, the governmental needs of um, getting more tax from sake. And so a lot of big man manufacturers, big sake maker could afford to make supreme grade. It sounds quite, you know, appealing for the consumers, but a lot of small, small producers couldn't afford to make ones. So many of them are making first grade or second grade. Um, around that time, with very, very deep war time and interwar, uh, the development of black market 
has been um, quite uh, popular at that time. So around this chaotic uh, um, war time or the post war time, a large amount of illegal moonshine liquors, um, such as methyl no sake, uh, methyl sake or kasutori sake, which means you kind of refermenting the li, sake li, um, leftover from the sake fermentation to make more alcohol, um, or bomb sake. Um, it was again moonshine made from pure alcohol. It's a lot of very unhealthy. Um, you can kind of see on the PowerPoint some guys drinking. Um, if you can read them, they were well, alcohol percentage written in the Japanese characters. Um, so like 40% or 13% so based on alcohol, they're ordering the sake, I guess, and it was um, in the black market. So a lot of people actually um, kill themselves by drinking fuel alcohol and, you know, um, the quality of the sake really worsened around this time. And uh, 1945, this is the only year that the National New Sake Contest, Zenkoku uh, Shinshu Kampyoka, has been cancelled because of the war time. Okay, uh, Julia, if you can move on to the next slide, thank you. Um, and then we are going to the post-war, um, end of war time. Um, so we reopened the new, new sake contest in the following year. And what I can see from this is a big, big progress of the Japanese um, economy. So we lost the war, but um, very, very rapidly, they, we rebuilt the country again. And um, sake kind of followed with this economic boom as well. So after all this you know, harsh quality of the black market sake, um, the appearance of sanzoshu was uh, one of the trial the government invented in order to um, make the sake a little bit safer and the consistent qualities. So sanzoshu translates as shuipo diluted sake. So it's kind of the similar sake as a gose seishu, the sinks, uh, the, the um, sorry, gose seishu that I mentioned earlier, um, that's been made uh, in the Taisho period, the synthetic sake. So um, in order to make the sake um, with a big, uh, with a smaller quantity of the rice. Uh, the, you add, after the sake has been fermented, you add the uh, rice has been fermented, you add the distilled alcohol, uh, some minerals, succinic acid, glucose, uh, lactic acid, glutamic acid, citric acid, so a lot of other flavor profiles, um, as well as sugar. Um, so kind of flavoring and then diluting, topping up with the water. So you could actually, it's called triple diluted because you know, if you have a one part of the sake, you could actually make three times more volume by adding other things in. So this, um, it's become a form of kind of modern, base of modern sake um, or that's connected to Futsushu culture, it's quite regular sake um, still drunk today. So, but this, but the people has had a safer option to um, drink a lot of the moonshine um, this time. Um, and then we had uh, the, the kind of economic miracle happened um, around this, all this industrial era. The Jap Japanese um, continued to grow their own economies between 54 to 70 in a very, very rapid way. Um, and there were Tokyo Olympics in 1964 as well. So um, around this time, the big, big expansion of the sake uh, production happened. The production really, you know, uh, no, rice was uh, no longer shortage, so people could afford to buy rice as well. The government also encouraged the people to produce more sake as well. So with the growth of the economy, um, people drank a lot of sake. So um, oke uri or oke gai culture has been formed around this time. So oke means barrel, um, uri means the cell, gai, oke gai, the barrel guy, uh, guy means to, to, to buy. So this is, this is kind of like this OEM culture of the sake from small sake maker to big manufacturer because um, the sake was taxed at the, um, because uh, still the rice, how do you call it, um, quota system. So only limited amount of rice was being distributed from the government to each sake producer. But the big manufacturer wanted to make more. So what they did was they actually OEM'd to smaller sake maker to make the sake for them because the sake uh, tax at this time was um, only taxed at the bottling and shipment. 
So there was no obligation of tax payment for the, for, uh, for the people who makes one. So they're actually selling an unpacked sake to the big sake makers and they put their own labels um, and then sell it to the market. So this kind of OEM culture really expanded around this time, which means a smaller, tiny family sake brewer um, had to give up their own way of sake making. They could only make sake for the big sake maker with their own request. Um, and, um, yeah, so this big kind of relationship has been formed around this time, as well as uh, one cup sake um, has been invented at the Olympics time. Um, maybe you've heard of it in a small kind of 180 mil glass cup you can see on the picture in the slides. Um, you can pop open and drink straight from the glass. Um, so this was being invented for the all the, all the uh, you know, you can still drink observing or watching the Olympics games and drink sake straight. So that's, that's the time there. Um, and then uh, the jizake, uh, jizake boom has been hit around this time in the 70s. Um, so people started to, so as I mentioned, a um, lot of big companies are making sake from the smaller makers. So a lot of consumer started to think, oh, maybe I want to drink something else um, from the countryside that's not the, coming from the big company. So uh, craft sake, jizake means craft sake, um, that's kind of uh, becoming, becoming a little bit boom around this time. And uh, this is the end of Food Control Act, so introduction of the Self uh, Lice Distribution Act, which was formed in 1969. The, the older sake maker can grow their own rice this time. So some sake makers switch their own production, uh, switch their own way of sake making to um, hiring, uh, you know, or con started to work with the contractor farmers to grow their own rice. And uh, in 1973, that's the biggest uh, category sales, biggest sake source, source, uh, source were reported um, within a sake history. But unfortunately, after this 97, um, the sake uh, shipment consumption, sake brewery numbers continued to decline, unfortunately. Um, some people say it's because of the social background of people, Japanese people become westernized, our food culture has been changed, diet has been changed. Um, but I personally think it's not only that. Um, you know, knowing that sake had this rich um, Jumai classic culture that's appreciating the techniques of the ancestors, um, the government really changed them around by you know, making them efficient, big volumes, and stable quality rather than the quality. Um, that's kind of, um, I personally think it's a main reason why a lot of consumer lost their interest in sake. And probably that's why the sake consumption has been decreasing ever since this 73. Can you please uh, flip to the next page for me? And then we have Heisei period, which is quite recent. Um, I'm sure many of you are already born this time. Um, in Japan, we we had this great infla uh, inflation of economic bubbles, uh, so baburuki, um, happened between 86 to 91. Um, there was big ginjo boom this time. Uh, so ginjo category has been oppressed because of the war, but after war, um, that's the category that people wanted to go, go for, forward, together with the craft sake boom. So very floral, fragrant type of sake is becoming really famous in the market, as well as this Niigata style, tanrei karakuchi sake. So tanrei karakuchi means uh, crisp, dry, and light sake. Um, that's kind of, kind of signature style of Niigata prefecture. Um, so imagine you, all these uh, workers have been working in the primary industry as a, a, like farmers or fishermen or timbers, you know, working sweaty everyday life, making you know, vegetables or whatever in the primary industry. And they, they after the war, they changed the industry completely because, because of this economic growth. Um, so more and more people are actually working in a, you know, the third industry or as an office worker. So working on the desk work every day. So the type of sake that's been demanded from the, uh, the consumer has been nearly changed this time. So up until then, all the sake was quite rich and sweet. That's what all these primary industry people needed. You know, they, they needed the sugar to just, you know, they can drink straight and get become an energy. 
but around this desk um, um, economic bubble time that um, everybody switched into this IT sectors, so, you know, working with the computer work and office work, um, they looking for something more restrained, something a little bit more elegant, um, something that's more, a little bit cleaner than the sake that I've been drinking. And probably that's the um, reason behind this uh, Niigata clean dry sake boom or the Ginjo floral sake boom. And then uh, 1992, um, the Qubits system, this great fast, supreme first second system grades has been abolished and been introduced the Tokute Meishoshu system. So this is a system that a lot of people are very, very familiar to these days. Can you flip to the, to the next page for a second? Thank you. So um, maybe if you have taken like level one sake course, this is the very basic, basic information you learned about how to categorize the premium sake. So there's another whole category outside of premium called futsushu, which is a regular or standard sake that um, takes up 60 or 70% of the industry. But the premium sake um, that we have been talking is, is uh, categorized by rice polishing ratio, which means how much rice has been taking uh, remaining from after, after polishing or milling, plus um, addition of the distilled alcohol. So by adding a distilled alcohol, it gives a cleaner, fresher, aromatic styles uh, when it's being uh, ginjo categories. And the amount of distilled alcohol allowed to add for this premium sake is very limited um, compared to the other standard style of sake um, that's coming from this triple diluted or synthetic sake that in the past. So they are only adding a distilled alcohol for the quality. Um, and there's another whole Jumai category, which you, know, you don't even add a distilled alcohol in. So these are considered as a premium. And this, this, become, um, um, this being introduced in 1992 for the very first time. Um, so you, know, you think Daiginjo has been with us for a long time, but it's really a new, new, uh, new ideas and categories that we've been drinking. You can go back to the previous slide again. Slide again. Thank you. So that is a Tokute Meishoshu system, uh, which categorizes the sake based on the polishing ratio of distilled alcohol addition and how much alcohol you add. And there was a Futsushu, that's still a continuous category from Sanzoshu, the triple diluted sake that's considered as a, as a table sake. Um, and then uh, in 1998, uh, there's a very fast, uh, you know, with the, in the response to declining sake industry, uh, uh, this sake producer, Ichinokura, from Miyagi Prefecture, released this uh, sake that's very, very low alcoholic and something fizzy. So they released a very fast sparkling sake. It was called Suzune Sparkling. It comes in a very feminine small bottle, very, very low alcohol, like 5%, and very fluty and sweet, bubbly. So they try to attract the female, younger audience to this, and uh, they become quite successful. So a lot of borrowing producers started making sparkling sake from them. But again, sparkling sake category is still less than uh, 20 years old, actually uh, just about 20 years old category, very young category. And then uh, 99, Juyon uh, Dai Sake has been given birth. So some sake geeks people, you know Juyon Dai, it's most expensively, how do you call it, most um, traded with a lot of premiers and expensive prices, especially in Asian countries. It's kind of become a cult sake brand that everybody wanted to um, get, but very, very limited quantity. So it's kind of very um, mystery and you know, cult sake maker still today. Um, so the first Juyon that has been sold in 99, that's um, kind of leading sake maker um, from Yamagata, Yamagata Prefecture, um, Takagi Shuzo, who actually um, changed the dynamic of or system of the sake production. So the Kuramoto Toji has been introduced. So Kuramoto in Japanese means sake brewer and Toji means uh, master sake brewer. So, you know, sake brewery owner being a sake master brewer, it makes sense to me today, but back on, uh, up until this time, all the Kuramoto, which means the sake brewery owner, were face of the brewery, not touching any production. And instead, they'll hire the master brewer, Toji, um, as, a, from the, as a seasonal worker. So a lot of Tojis or sake makers uh, contracted seasonal workers who is working in the first, uh, so the primary industry in the farms or you know, fisher, as a fisherman's 
during the summertime and when the, there's nothing in the farm, so see, they walk um, at, the, at the sake brewery. So this system has been working you know, since Edo period, but uh, because of the declining of the sake um, industry, they could no longer afford hiring seasonal tojis. That's quite expensive as well. Um, so instead of hiring expensive, very experienced old toji who is over like 80 years old, for example, um, the owner or son of the brewery himself uh, go to University of Agriculture, learn about brewing, probably um, works as an uh, apprentice at some of the breweries of several years, and then um, works, become a toji in their own 30s or 40s. Uh, Julia, it's previous. Uh, Slide, sorry. So that's called Kuramoto Toji. Uh, yes, that's it. Um, that's a Kuramoto Toji. And after this Juyondai boom, a um, lot of craft sake makers um, become Kuramoto Toji himself. So instead of just observing a business, they started to actually hands on sake making, that, which makes sense. You know, if you wanted to make sparkling sake and talking to your 80 years old Toji, can you make sparkling sake from tomorrow? They can't do it. So you know, with a, with a fast changing trend, um, this really made sense to, um, you know, catch up with a trend and survive in a, um, by survive, uh, surviving in the sake industry. Um, sorry, the time is going up, but I'll try to quickly go through this time and talk about the now and future. Um, the Doburoku um, Toku has been established around this time. So Doburoku has been, the, the home brewing sake has been uh, prohibited for a long time, um, but this year, 2002, they created the special zone, segregated zone to make doburoku. If you, as long as you register, you can still make uh, doburoku in a certain areas of Japan. And um, and then uh, we go into the millennium around 2000. Um, I can say some of the trends around this time is internationalism, interna internationalization of sake makers. So some of you might be familiar with uh, Kuheiji, uh, Kamoshibita Kuheiji Domain 9, or Dasai. Um, these sake makers market themselves the overseas market. So they wanted to make sake that you know, American people, Western people can enjoy together with French cuisine, or American cuisine, you know, the, the, you know, going outside of the box of the Japanese food. Um, and around this time, the, um, the uh, United States National Sake Appraisal and Joy of Sake started in, in, in states. And also, uh, 2007 International Wine Challenge has been, the sake category has been established. So a lot of international competitions, um, events has been very, very booming outside of Japan that helped the popularity of the sake uh, export as well. And then diversifying sake as well. So um, around 2000s, a lot of people are going back to origins. So um, because sake has been kind of violated with lots of addition of distilled alcohol and sugars and other acid, acids, some group of sake maker wanted to go back to original 100% Junmai brewery. So Junmaist or Junmaism kind of become a keyword to make, oh, we only make Junmai sake. We don't add anything to the sake. And uh, also going back to the kimoto or bodai moto, the type of sake that I was drinking earlier, the very classic um, style of um, fermenting techniques that ancient people have been invented, as well as muroka, which means anchako find, instead of stripping out, stripping out all this uh, instability from the sake to make it stable, uh, they don't go through the chako finding to keep them muroka. Or nama, which means unpasteurized. You wanted to sell the very vibrant, flav uh, flavorful sake to the market as, as unpasteurized or genshu, undiluted, um, you know, by adding a this uh, water in to dilute, it makes the sake easier to drink, but it, it also dilute the flavor as well. So a lot of, this, a lot of people, are, a producer uh, kind of chose not to do all this uh, processing and kind of un style of sake become quite popular, as well as bringing back the kiyoke that wouldn't borrow to ferment, and sticking with a local rice instead of using a very king of sake rice, Yamada Nishiki. Um, and going back to the ambient East rather than a cultivated association East. And, um, you know, grow their own rice or try to use the rice that's unpolished, kind of going back to, going back to 
uh, origins because one time the ginjo boom was going too much that uh, some producers started to porridge rice to the you know very extreme level um, like few percent one percent so uh, they're going back to unporridged try to make the elegant sake using unporridged rice um, and some sake maker like Aramasa the cult sake maker has been started to giving very popular so continuous popularity um, you can flip to the next page yeah. We are in uh, the next one, please. We are in a Leiwa period, which started from last year. Um, just to talk a little bit about the current situation of the sake industry, um, as you can see in the chart, ever since this uh, peak of the in 70s hit um, the sake consumption um, and also uh, sake brewery numbers has been declining to one third. Um, because of all the reasons that I've mentioned, westernization culture, uh, you know, this kind of futsushu drinks kind of not really suiting to the present today. Um, and, uh, you know, the government controlled too much of the sake production one time, and it was quite difficult for the producer to bring back the control by themselves and kind of identify themselves who they are. Um, so we, we've been struggling in the past, seven years <laughs> and and then we have this coronavirus coming this year which has really been damaging the industry at this moment i've been talking with several sake makers um most of the producers are down um 80 percent to some good producer maybe 60 percent down from the previous year um in a four uh, in the past two three months um that's not just the sake brewery um, itself, it connects to the restaurant that's been selling, the distributor has been importing, um, you know, retail shops that's been selling sake, as well as going back to the rice farmers who's been growing rice. And now in, we are nearly in um, no, April, May. This is the time a lot of sake maker make an order for the following year's rice. So they'll talk, they're, you know, debating how many, you know, how much should we buy for the following year? We don't know what's going to happen for, you know, for the next year, next several years. And imagine the rice farmers, they, you know, they just finished all this. Um, they're kind of like coming um, in, in a bubble that they're not really understanding the situation. And all of a sudden the sake makers are saying, we want to press all the 50%, you know, down from previous year. That's a big shock. And it's not just the business and money. Um, if you stop making rice, that affects the nature, how do you call it, um, bio, bio, biorhythm of the natures in the regions, um, because you have to main, main, maintain the rice fields every year. And if you cannot maintain the rice fields, that means you know, the, a lot of rice fields have been abundant. Mountain has been abundant for a long time. And what's happening is a lot of wild animals living in the mountain with um, abundant mountain coming down to the city center and you know taking humans food which is and attacking the household as well it's being a really issue and not just that like you know we have a lot of rainfalls and as you know the rice cultivation in japan um is a wet rice cultivation so if you're not making a rice that means you know how much you water that's coming from the snow water or rain water coming from the river it's going to change completely so um I think at this moment we're in a panic state and really thinking about the economic factor the most. But in a very fundamental sense, we really have to think of how this would affect to the nature, how that would uh, affect to the you know, um, ec ecological system of, of the earth and how we can still make sake or how we can appreciate. And that, I think that is becoming going to be a very big um, topic, I think, from, from the next uh, from this year, I think. And um, that's why I'm writing at the end, uh, in Nizo Riel Jizake. So Jizake means craft sake. Um, I think the, con the, the, the term or the definition of Jizake has been started to change depending on the year. But what I'm talking about this Jizake is the you drink the sake local to your own place. So I know everybody's coming from different countries now. Um, but we have a lot of sake makers outside of Japan, very international. Um, can you flip to the next page? So this is another whole topic I wanted to expand probably in a future webinar, um, the sake brewery outside of Japan. I don't want to go too deep, but we have 
40 plus, maybe over 40 sake breweries existing at this moment outside of Japan. So first it came from all these immigrants, um, you know, tried to fill the immigrants' needs uh, that's moved to Brazil, Hawaii, America, uh, California. And then uh, slowly, a um, lot of craft sake scene started to be made in states, um, coming from, you know, the starting from sake one in 92. And a lot of other Asian countries followed in the 90s, like China, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam. Um, and then uh, we have all these quite big um, um, craft sake scenes out uh, within Europe and other parts of uh, non america countries too. Qu please flip to the next page. Thank you. So we have, this is all only two, um, after 2000, year, uh, year 2000. So sorry if I'm missing, I'm, I did uh, try to do this as, as much as possible, but I'm not the uh, you know, perfect uh, in this sense for the, for the information. But um, this is what of the sake brewery and um, that's been established after 2000, year, uh, year 2000. So we have this artisan sake maker from Vancouver, Canada, um, Taiwanese sake maker that's um, also uh, not the governmental owned one, that's new. And we have sake, first sake maker from Texas, first sake maker from Ontario, first sake maker from Maine. Uh, we have some North Carolina and um, some Sequoia, Sequoia is a first San Francisco made sake and Setting Sun is um, uh, San Diego, California. And we have a Zenkuro from New Zealand, yay. And then we have Nami from Mexico, uh, Kensho from Spain, and Seda Liquida, the, um, the liquid silk from Catania, Spain. Um, and then this, I can't pronounce this French royal one. Um, that means a tear um, of the dragon. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's also I mean, uh, the first French sake maker. And we have some, uh, some more European ones, Kampai, sake, London Sake Brewery, and then we have, um, sorry, we have um, Proper Sake Company, uh, then Sake Maker from Oakland, California, Arizona, first sake, Arizona Sake, and then we have Dojima, the second Sake Maker from UK, uh, the locates in Cambridgeshire. Uh, I think the Sake Maker is still is, is with us tonight, Very exciting. Um, and then we got Brooklyn Kura, very modern sake maker that's in the center of New York. Um, they've been quite active in the webinar, so I highly recommend you to check their online talks and the events um, to join what they're doing. And then the, the kind of Honolulu um, sake production in Honolulu was the actually very first one in history, but they closed. So they, some, some person revived production of sake in Honolulu, which is called Icelander Sake Brewery. And Wakaze, which is the first sake in Paris, uh, done by Japanese uh, young team. Um, and then we have a second New York sake a brewery, Kato Sake Works. So lots of exciting things happening outside of Japan. And so what I meant by drink real jizake is, yes, we have to support sake industry by drinking you know, sake directly coming from Japan, but also um, like a lot of logistic issues, business issues. It's, it might be not easy to have a widest range of selections. So I highly recommend you to try out your own local sake. And you know, that can be your daily sake. And then on a very special occasions, uh, once a week or twice, uh, once in a month, you can you know, open a very special sake coming from Japan. Um, so in that way, you can support the whole industry itself and uh, you know, becoming a part of the sake history. Um, so this is all from me. I'm sorry, I wanted to quick finish quickly, um, so I didn't have to take out your questionnaire time. Um, Julia, are there any questions that um, has been asked with the chat? Uh, I think you, most of them have been answered as you go along. There was one on um, sales of sparkling sake. I don't know if you know much about how much sparkling sake is being sold. Uh, I don't know the quantity or category. It's still a very, very small category. Mm. Um, I think the main challenge is the price point. A lot of sake maker um, try to market as a kind of champagne style alternative to champagne. They put in the very premium bottles and make, make them expensive. So um, in order to compete with the champagne, it's another, another whole challenge. So um, 
you know, it's still a very, very small category, but it's, it's been expanding, I can say. Yeah, that was asked by our Prosecco expert, so I imagine he was a bit worried. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend you to try a sparkling sake. There's lots of categories, um, uh, lots of different styles. Yeah. Cool. Another question just come up here. Um, do you think sake should remain 100% Japanese? Um, as in made in, in, in Japan, I mean? That was just the question that was written. Um, not, not really a clarification there. Yeah, so recently Japanese government um, set the GI terms or ge ge geographically identified term for Japanese sake or Nihonshu. Nihonshu means Japanese sake in Japanese. Um, to be only sake made within Japan using rice um, from Japan. So these sake makers that's been listing this page, uh, not Nihonshu or not Japanese sake, but they are obviously sake. So you have to, I think, it, it's important we understand the difference and we pay our respect to a Japanese sake category. But um, as a sake, you know, the people who love Japanese sake and maybe, you know, wanted to expand that to their own cultures in their own country, um, that's quite nice, nice as well. So I, 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 I'm full support of all the sake brewery outside of Japan as well as the sake made in Japan as well. Uh, getting a couple more questions here. Um, Someone's asked about Richard Jeffrey. I don't know if that's a sake person or not, but I'm not familiar with the name. Does that mean anything to you? Richard Jeffrey, ring my bell. Who is this? Somebody can. So maybe someone can clarify that. A uh, question about yeast. Um, I thought the yeast, the use of ambient yeast was too difficult to control to use. Are a lot of Kura using ambient yeast? At this moment, it's very, very handful. But it is growing. Maybe I only know at this moment less than 10 breweries in Japan uses ambient yeast. But together with kind of reviving a uh, shubo like a uh, uh, Kimoto or Yamaha or Bodaimoto, it's make it easier to cultivate with a uh, ambient yeast strain as well. So it will grow, but it's still a quite unsafe way if you are so used to, um, you know, how isolated yeast as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Uh, another question about um, yes. uh, wood, type of wood used to age sake? Type of wood, is cedar is the main, um, main wood that's been mostly used for like uh, all the wooden equipment or the barrels. That's believed to be has a kind of a sanitation or sanitizing, sanitizing uh, effect to the sake. And it's also a sacred tree as well, because the sake was made in a Shinto shrine, so that's always a connection in the history. Some made with a cypress tree, but uh, some people said a hinoki, but the hinoki is very strong aroma tree. Um, it really enhances the flavor. So I haven't really seen hinoki trees they use for the sake um, brewing. Cool. Uh, another question about aging sake. Um, how long can you keep mm -hmm. it? What's the best way to keep it? Yeah, so really depending on the style. So if you're drinking very fragrant, fresh, delicate style of ginjo sake, um, I would recommend to drink them maybe less than one year after bottling. Um, normally in the back of the sake label, there's a bottling date written here. Um, so these categories, uh, if it's unpasteurized, even shorter, uh, you have to drink quite fresh and young. But some sake like this that I'm drinking, this is brewed in 2016. So it's been already four years and still been evolving in the, in the bottle and the glass. It's really tasty as well. So these sake is called macho sake um, or aged sake, koshu, jukuseishu or koshu that has more umami and you know, viscosity, richness, um, food full of flavor, but really works well with a, even non-Japanese style of food as well. So um, I know a lot of people started to leave. I just wanted to make a little announcement that um, hopefully with, Julie, with the help of WCT and Julia, we can continue to do this uh, sake webinar with WCT uh, in the future. But I'm also trying to um, set up my own webinar uh, classes under my business, Museum of Sake. Um, I'll try to announce this on my Instagram or website. Um, the idea is, um, you know, uh, I wanted to kind of raise a little bit more money so I can support for um, sake industry as well as uh, NHS and the uh, hospitality industry in UK. So um, it's, it's been great that the WCT has been offering a lot of free webinars, but I wanted to make a little bit more different um, categories so we can support the other industries too. So please keep, pre, uh, keep, keep uh, checking my website if you can.
So, okay. um, I'm trying to keep an eye on questions here, but there's quite a lot of comments coming mm. through. If anyone has any questions that they missed, um, please feel free to email me. My, uh, my name is uh, Jay Lambeth at wsetglobal.com. It was on your confirmation email, and I can pass um, any questions that have been missed on to Natsuki. Um, yeah, otherwise, all that's left to say really is um, well, thank you so much for preparing that. It was uh, really interesting, so much uh, to understand, to know about. Um, yeah, hopefully. Uh, more more things that we can learn about in the future but in the meantime i think as you correctly said um everyone just get ordering from their local producer and let's get that little someone called it quite a sad little graph that you showed we need to get that tipping back up the other way somehow yeah i'll say on the on my website actually i made a list of sake that you can buy online and at this moment it's only uh europea european countries but uh there's actually quite a big list of uk sections that you can buy all the sake from the local sake distributors online and all the sake, local sake makers as well. So please uh, try to support the local business, the local sake dis distributors and shops as well. All right, and that's, uh, that's something we all can do. Everyone get online now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. I wish I could talk 